everybody, your friendly neighborhood, elite, fear-free, and low-stress handling, registered veterinary technician and cat and dog behavior consultant, Tabitha Kusera here to share with you a few videos of my cat's veterinary visits, including medical procedures such as obtaining their blood work, receiving an injection, and more, utilizing fear-free and cooperative care techniques. What is fear-free and cooperative care? So thankfully, we call it practicing medicine because we're always improving and getting better. And the veterinary field has grown so much as far as not only addressing the physical well-being of animals, but also the emotional well-being. We understand now that scruffing and stretching that senior cat or using five people to sit on a dog for a nail trim we know now that those animals won't be fine. They'll remember that. And that's the, the cat that won't go in the carrier or the dog that won't even walk into the vet. And not only is it not good for the animals, but it actually puts us animal professionals at risk too, because those animals understandably are more likely to result in fear aggressive behavior. The most common reason why cats and dogs bite are due to you guys fear and pain. And as a veterinary professional, I see a lot of patients who have fear and pain. But the good news is we as a field have understood that it's all about addressing the physical and mental well-being of animals. And there is actually a lot we can do to help reduce fear, anxiety, and stress in our pets. And that's where cooperative care and fear free comes in. So fear free is a program that's available online and offers education for animal professionals to learn skills and new tools on how to decrease fear, anxiety, and stress, including gentle control and considered approach. And those are two techniques that I will be using throughout these videos. And I'll be honest, I use those with every animal I work with. And cooperative care is a separate thing, but it's all about training your animal outside of the actual medical procedure. So we work up to that, but training your animal to not only tolerate handling and husbandry procedures, but to be an active willing participant in those. And in these cases, the animal either gives consent by doing a behavior as in consent by what I mean by consent, yes or no, or they're easily distracted by food with minimal to no signs of stress. And it takes time to teach your animals these things. And you'll see in these videos, I'm utilizing all of these lovely techniques and things go so smoothly and my cats have a lot less stress, which results in what? Me a lot less stressed, everyone around me a lot less stressed. It's a win, win, win. So I'm just gonna go over a few things that you're gonna see throughout these videos. Again, two things I commonly use with every animal I deal with is something called considered approach and gentle control. So considered approach is not just about how you approach the animal, which does make a really big difference, of course. So I do what I can to utilize considered approach, approach them from the side, avoid direct eye contact, avoid being like, hi, see that scared you. Um, so it definitely would scare a dog or a cat but it's also about recognizing all the sensory and environmental inputs that that animal is receiving and doing what I can, because we can't control everything, but guys, there is a lot we can to create an environment that is less stressful for the pet. A few examples is instead of a cold metal table that's slippery, I'm gonna provide a non-slip mat for every animal I work with along with a comfy towel. I'll be honest, I use towels right out of the dryer and it makes a big difference, which I understand because going into my preheated car makes a really big difference, especially in Ohio right now. Um, or playing classical music to help drown out some of those other sounds in a shelter or a veterinary hospital that let's be honest guys, it's stressful. And then gentle control, which is the way I handle the animals I work with. And I'll be honest, handling is a skill. There's no cookie cutter, one size fits all way to handle animals. And I'll be honest with you guys, my experience, I was taught one restraint for cats and one restraint for dogs. And I'm a veterinary technician who has a lot more experience than the cat caregiver, right? So as you can imagine, one size does not fit all. And when it comes to handling, it's all about critically thinking and 
assessing that animal's body language, assessing mine, right? And working with that individual animal in front of me. So it's all about assessing the animal's body language and being flexible with my handling techniques based on that cat's individual preference. I'm going to allow the animal to remain in their chosen position and I'm gonna vary my touch with the animal's response. So you're gonna see throughout these videos, I'm gonna actually narrate them to help you see all the things that I'm doing in order to help prevent and manage fear, anxiety, and stress in the cats that I work with. But also you'll see the progress my cats have made utilizing this, these techniques. Because again, guys, if an animal or human has a traumatic experience, they remember, right? So of course we wanna do this because we love animals. Less stressful animals means less stressful us and less risk of injury to everyone, which is a win-win. But also they remember, right? So the more positive experiences we provide them, the happier they are at the vets. So thanks for watching, here's the video. This is a video of a medial saphenous blood draw on a cat. A medial saphenous vein is located on the inner rear leg of a cat. Prior to the blood draw, Cupcake was examined and topical lidocaine was applied to her leg. Prior to the exam and blood work, we had all the items needed for an exam and blood draw to minimize us entering and exit, exiting the room. And that also helps to decrease her wait time. Cupcake is on a yoga mat covered with a warm towel right out of the dryer, and that helps to provide a non-slip and comfortable surface for her. For Cupcake, we chose to draw from her medial saphenous because this is what she was most comfortable with, being in a sternal position, which just means sitting up. This is me applying churro to a licky mat. She's like, I'm ready for this. And I was using the churro to lure her to move her instead of physically manipulate her, but she couldn't really tell from there. And then she's like, oh, I see it. So, and then she's following it, but I'm like, I'll just place the licky mat right in front of you. She begins to actively eat, ears are forward. Body language is not tense as far as the tension throughout her body. She's soft. You can see here, Rachel applies alcohol to a small gauze and uses a small amount. Cats are very sensitive to scent. And you guys, alcohol is a very strong and aversive scent. So what I used to do, you know, 12, 13 years ago, where I would have a ketchup bottle and just douse the cat's leg with alcohol, I realized that that could cause a lot of stress. We all know better, do better. So that's why Rachel's applying it to a small gauze to apply to her. I would not recommend applying alcohol with a spray bottle because many cats, as you can imagine, have a negative experience with those. You can see I support her whole body when gently turning her rear legs and allow her to remain in a natural sitting position as she's actively eating. I avoid karate chopping her leg to hold off for the other technician and instead I just apply a gentle pressure pressure I'm kind of rubbing and petting her along her neck which she really enjoys but this I this is also my restraints Rachel is using a butterfly to obtain her blood as you can see here her tail is flicking a small amount but ears are still forward, body's soft. She's like, what are you doing, lady? <laughs> kind of checking things out, like what's going on, and then goes back to eating. Both me and the technician do our best to not loom over her. And the technician communicates to me what she's doing softly and quietly and when she will be removing the needle so I can apply slight pressure to the blood draw site. And you'll see that I actually start to move with Cupcake, allowing her to readjust herself instead of having her rear leg stay out longer. I move with her when I am applying that pressure. She's like, give me my butt. <laughs> and she finished the churro, so I'm refilling. 
And throughout her exam and blood draw, of course, I was assessing her body language the entire time. Cupcake's body language throughout the procedure was fairly great. She was actively eating at a normal pace. Her ears were forward. Her body wasn't tense. Her eyes were just partially dilated, but her eyes were almond shaped. Her tail was close to her body with some slight flicker, flicking, but I was aware of that. And Cupcake did great. This is a video of me vaccinating a kitten. This isn't my kitten, but that kitten's in a happy home now. I have the great pleasure of working with some local rescues, and this is actually a wonderful foster who had quite a few kittens that she was fostering at the time, and we set up a day to examine and vaccinate them with the help of a veterinarian as well. And prior to the exam and vaccines, I set up a comfortable environment, including having everything I needed prior to the exam. This included a variety of reinforcers, which just are things that cats love, which are toys, treats, and brushes. I have their carrier, which they're familiar with, as you can see on the side, and it has towels in it. I could use those towels if needed for gentle control if the kittens begin to experience fear, anxiety, and stress. I sprayed myself in the table with feel away, which is just a cat pheromone. And there's a yoga mat and towel on the table to help provide a non-slip surface, as well as I am playing a purring app. Purring is a self-soothing behavior for cats. So I've found it really helpful to play during procedures to kind of minimize the stressors of other sounds. And purring is a calming sound for kitties and for me. So you can see they're playing with the toy. I have that licky mat with the churro. Again, I have everything I need because you don't want to be in the middle of an exam and then be like, oh, you're exhibiting some fear. I'm going to change up what I'm doing and have to go get it, right? I noticed that that toy is kind of big. Kittens tend to play with toys that big, but let's be honest, guys, mice don't just run in the cat's face. So you're going to see I communicate with the foster and ask her to change the toy. The kitten's body language is relaxed, tail is up and curved, ears are forward, she's watching the toy a bit. So the amount of focus got a lot more, the focus increased on that new toy because those types of toys move like prey. And I observed that and shared that with the foster to help play with her while I was vaccinating. So I'm utilizing something called a touch gradient. So we, what that is, is basically getting the animal familiar with your touch. So I'm not just grabbing your skin, pinching and poking and then stopping to stopping touch. Cause as you can imagine, that could be a little startling. So I assess the cat's body language. Cause of course, like every cat I work with, I'm working with the individual cat in front of me and I'm assessing their body language the entire time. And I gently touch her from her neck to her shoulder to assess if her body language changes at all and also to desensitize her a bit to my hand. You're going to see I'm going to vaccinate her here. And then I'm going to touch, continue to touch the area. So again, it's not a startle poke stop. And the kitten is continuing to play. And I allowed the kitten to stand how she was comfortable. And I'll be honest, I use play in kittens to vaccinate them and examine them a lot because it creates a positive experience from the start. And obviously, it's a lot easier and less stressful for everyone. And I had full control over this kitty because, as you can imagine, kittens and cats don't just go from green body language to red in five seconds. Usually there's a lot of signs to indicate that. And then I would change up what I was doing throughout this entire time. This body, this kitten's body was loose, wiggly, ears were forward, body language was soft, eyes were almond shaped. She was focused on the toy. And that's why I continued to proceed. 
And then we're like, hey, you're done. We have to get another kitten. But it's really great that she's not running away from me immediately because we started and ended on a positive note. And again, it's so great with kittens especially because their first experiences with medical procedures and restraint, it's really important for us to keep them positive, right? Here is an example of cooperative care with my beautiful Siamese, Malt. So Malt has arthritis, and in, in addition to her other medications and treatments, she is on Adequan injections to help manage her pain. Prior to this video, I worked with Malt to create a treatment station, which is the pink mat that you're seeing. I paired it with her favorite treats in the Licky mat without doing any treatments. And by doing this, I am putting money in her treatment bank and creating a positive association with the mat. Some treatments may be slightly uncomfortable, resulting in a small withdrawal from that bank of positive experiences, but I've created reserves to minimize impact and keep it positive. So this is a consent behavior called stationing. When she chooses to go to the mat and station, that's her telling me yes. When she steps off the mat, that's her telling me no. And we've worked on this a lot. In this video, as you can see, she goes to the mat, and says yes, yes, yes throughout the entire procedure. She, I also utilize considered approach. So I approach her from the side. And as this is an injection, after drawing it up, I change the needle to a new needle because once a needle is used more than once, as you can imagine, it gets more jagged and jagged and jagged. And it changing needles is just a really easy, inexpensive thing to make injections less stressful. And I also use a touch gradient prior to and after giving the injection. So let's take a look. She's like, mom, let's do this. <laughs> Please give me the game. Let's play the game. So she goes to the mat. I apply the churro to the mat. This is a touch gradient where I start from a less stressful place to a more stressful place. So for most cats, a non-stressful place is heads, neck, shoulders. And you can see I go from the head, neck, shoulders to the rear. And again, body language is positive. Tail is up and high. Ears are forward. Body is soft. Actively eating at a normal pace for malt because she loves food. I give her the injection, and in this case, I'm giving the injection subcutaneously, which means under the skin. And then I touch her one more time afterwards, and she continues to stay on the mat. But throughout the work that me and Malt did to get this behavior, it's definitely worth it because now giving her injections is not stressful for her or me. And as you can see in all of these videos, because some people... I hear there's a common myth that some of these te techniques might take more time. Again, handling is a skill, right? And we need to apply all these things and learn. I was not this skilled at first. I used to do a lot of things that were more traditional restraint, but again, know better, do better. And once you have the skill, just like when I first started drawing blood as a technician, you guys, I wasn't great. <laughs> and that's okay. That's normal, right? Um, and now I'm a pro. So with this, it's less stress for everyone and, of course, takes a lot less time. And in the last video I'll be sharing today, Dr. Beth obtains a urinalysis from my cat Chip using cystocentesis, which is just a common clinical technique used to obtain a sample of urine directly from the bladder of Chip. And similar to the other cats prior to this vet visit, we had everything we needed to minimize entrance and exit. And it also, because being a tech in a shelter or vet clinic, we're really busy and we have a lot going on. So this also helps to save time by having everything prepared and you're less likely to forget anything, which is also great. But we had everything prepared. There's a non-slip surface. There's calming music playing. We had a variety of reinforcers, as you can see. Chip is in this still, is actively eating some of these treats. I utilize considered approach and gentle control, but let me get into it. So 
So I am using a C hold. So again, I'm very aware of my body where I have my hands around the cat's neck, but I'm actively rubbing and petting. And you can see I have my arm over the cat. So if needed, I basically have control right, left, forward, and back because I also have my abdomen pressed up next to the cat. Again, I'm not squeezing or holding tight because that's not indicated. And as you can imagine, when we hold an animal down tight or with force, understandably, that can cause them to panic. Just like if I was at the nurse's office and already a little anxious because that's normal and two straps came <laughs> on my chair, I would go from green body language to red very quickly. <laughs> the doctor is palpating for the bladder and we're communicating what she's going to do. As you can see, Chip is actively eating and I, we're both using a side approach and not looming over him or doing a full frontal approach because again, that could be scary for most animals. She tells me that she can feel the bladder and that she will be poking. So I start rubbing a little bit more. And again, I'm aware of where my arm is and my stomach is in relation to the cat's body. His body language is soft and his ears are forward. Eyes are almond shaped. He was actively eating. So there were, really were no changes in body language. But again, I'm assessing always and working and working with the cat in front of me. So he's like, nom, nom, nom. I'm still restraining. And then you're going to see his tail starts to go back and forth a tiny bit. So I'm aware of that. He lip licks, which can be a displacement behavior, which is basically a subtle anxiety behavior, similar to someone like a human scratching their head or biting their nail. But he could be licking in that context because he was just eating treats. But again, I was aware of all of these things. But his body doesn't tense up, ears don't go forward, or ears don't <laughs> go back. And then she obtains a urinalysis and he returns to baseline, even though the signs of anxiety we noticed were very subtle. He, you could see he quickly begins eating again. And the reason we chose to do a standing cysto for Chip is although he's a senior cat, He's an active senior cat and he's like his mom and doesn't like to sit still. So in some cases, I utilize towel restraint, which is why you've seen I've had those handling tools with or near me at all times. But with Chip, it's not that he's fearful because cats like to hide when they're scared and towels are great handling tools once we're taught on how to use them correctly because again... Towel restraint is a lot more than just tossing a towel over a cat. Your elbows need to be in a specific place. It's There's a lot of technique involved. But with Chip, he wasn't fearful. He just hates to stand still. And I explained to the veterinarian, who was my colleague, we worked together, and I said, I know Chip, <laughs> and he's not going to do well if we put him sternally because I'm a big fan of, again, having cats be in a position they prefer to be in. So like sitting on my lap, getting your urinalysis is a great way or sternal, again, him just laying down and the, maybe just moving his rear legs back so the doctor can palpate that bladder like we did with Cupcake with the blood work with the first video. And of course, we would not flip him over on his back to obtain his urinalysis because I have seen that technique used but that makes him feel unstable and unsafe. And understandably, it's going to cause more fear and stress. So that's why we decided to do a standing cysto with Chip. So again, it's all about the individual animal in front of you and context. We're going to do everything we can to create a low stress environment. And then when it comes to gentle control, Handling is not cookie cutter. It's not one size fits all. It's fun. And we work with the animal in front of us for what procedures we need. For watching, as you can see, 
fear-free and cooperative care is pretty awesome. And I wanted to share the love of these techniques and spread awareness because we all want less fear, stress, anxiety for the cats we love and care for, of course. Some resources to learn more, because I know you want to, props, um, is my website, chirrupsandchatter.com. And you can also follow me on Facebook and Instagram. Some other great resources to learn more, I have them written down so I don't forget, is icatcare.org, fearfreepets.com, and catvets.com. Those are areas you can find fear-free certified professionals as well as cat-friendly veterinarians and professionals. And remember, we're all doing the best we can with what we know, but it's really important to continue to educate ourselves and do the best by the animals we love. Know better, do better. Thanks, everybody.